Sure. Perhaps a year from now, we'll be doing this outside in an open air amphitheater. So I wanna welcome everybody to Ward 3, Ward 3 Vision session tonight, Building Inclusivity in Ward 3, What's in the Affordable Housing Toolbox? My name is David Christiel. I'm a member of Ward, the Ward 3 Vision Steering Committee, a consultant with LSA Planning and formerly Arlington County's Housing Director. Where during my time there, we preserved or helped develop over 4,000 affordable homes. Thank you for joining us. We've planned an information packed event for you tonight. For those of us new to you, new to us, War 3 Vision is a group of residents who imagine our neighborhoods as even better urban places, more walkable, sustainable, vibrant, and as is the focus of tonight's session, more affordable. Our most recent work is supporting and providing input to the update, the comprehensive plan. Overall, we believe many of the recommendations for land use, housing implementation, and the Rock Creek West elements and future land use map or FLUM will enhance the efforts to increase the supply of affordable homes here in Ward 3. Next slide, please. At Ward 3 Vision's last forum, Taking Down the Walls, our panel described how the history of segregation was linked to exclusionary practices and zoning. The forum was well received, so tonight is a follow-up to that event. It's important to keep this history in mind as a context to understanding the variety of tools we're gonna to discuss this evening and as we enter into the planning process for large pieces of Ward 3. These include Chevy Chase and Friendship Heights, as well as looking at potential infill sites in Woodley Park, Cleveland Park, Van Ness, and Tenley Town. The potential for more housing, including affordable housing in these areas will be aided by the comprehensive plan amendments now before the council. On this slide is a quote from ANC 34G's Racism Task Force. On behalf of Ward 3 Vision, I wanna commend ANC 34G's Racism Task Force and the report they completed last year. It recognizes the intersection of land use policy, housing, and racism. The report has a wonderful blueprint for incentivizing a range of housing options and identifies many of the land use and financing tools you'll hear about this evening. Next slide. Tonight, we'll explore a better future, homes affordable to more people here in Ward 3. The lack of affordable homes threatens the district's and region's future. How do we house an evolving and working, growing workforce? How do we expand housing options in parts of the region, much like Ward 3, that are close to employment and well served by transit, including bus and metro? How do we make Ward 3 more equitable and diverse, creating affordable homes here in perhaps the highest opportunity area of the district, which is, means having access to education, employment, shopping, recreation, open space, and a robust transportation network. You're gonna hear numbers tonight, so let's get started during the introduction. So Ward 3 or Rock Creek West planning area contains about 14% of the district's housing stock or about 49,000 homes, but only 1% of the district's affordable housing supply or about 470 homes. By comparison, Ward 8, far Southeast and Southwest planning area has 9% of the district's housing supply or about 31,000 homes, but 31% of the district's affordable housing supply are about 16,000 affordable homes. On this slide, there are thoughts from Council Member Mary Che. We wanna commend Council Member Che for recognizing this imbalance and her leadership and support for smart growth priorities, such as environmental responsibility and social equity, and her support for the update to the comprehensive plan. With her help, we can improve upon this housing affordability history. Next slide. So what do we mean by affordable housing? It's housing for people working in a wide range of jobs, looking for rental apartments or perhaps a relatively affordable condominium or housing cooperative unit. Homes for people whose incomes may qualify them for a government subsidy. It's also housing like an accessory dwelling unit or missing middle housing. These are options for people whose incomes are higher but not high enough to buy existing detached and semi-detached homes here in Ward 3. The focus of tonight's session is about homes for people employees and their families that could benefit from affordable homes if they were built in Ward 3. And some of the pictures on these next two slides illustrate where they're from. Frontline healthcare workers, teachers and teacher aides at schools like Merch, Deal and Wilson. People who work and clean our homes and cook and serve food at all the wonderful bakeries and restaurants in our neighborhood. Newly hired assistant professors and grad students at American University, the University of District of Columbia, Howard Law School, firefighters, 
are kids who went off to college and are back working at their first job and they don't want their bedrooms back. We want them to be our neighbors. Next slide, slide number six. As you'll see through tonight's session, producing affordable homes is complicated, but in the hands of skilled developers, capable partners, including us, the community, it's possible. We hope tonight's session will help us make Ward 3 more equitable, diverse, and inclusive. How do we achieve more affordable housing and more inclusive housing options? What tools, policy, land use, and finance are available for building more affordable homes in Ward 3? What tools are appropriate in which situations? Some of the tools may not work in certain circumstances. Where in Ward 3 are the opportunities to use tools you hear more about tonight? So join me in welcoming Councilmember Mary Che to give us a few opening remarks. She will be followed by Stan Wall and other panelists who will lead us through the components of housing affordability. Their experiences and information will lead us to consider next steps we can take to increase the supply of affordable homes here in Ward 3. Councilmember Che, welcome and the floor is now yours. Um, it originally said that you had to un start my video um, because unable to start video because your host has stopped it. All right, let me, um, let me figure that out. Rejected right from the beginning. Ah, oh. uh, sorry. Okay, here um, we are, start my video. Let's see, there you go. Thank you. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Uh, the issue about affordable housing is obviously front and center, not just because of the comprehensive plan, but because we lack uh, affordable housing all across the district, especially here in Ward 3. And we need to take the um, occasion of the comprehensive plan and ensuing legislation or activities you know from the executive side to figure out how we can provide the affordable housing that we need now in ward three there are uh three particular areas um that we should uh focus on i think you know in terms of their uh expanded potential this is beyond just infill uh they would be friendship heights there's a huge opportunity there uh Chevy Chase, and also the Wardman Hotel site down at the southern part of Ward 3. Now, infill sites are important as well, but I think these are, are uh, major opportunities that await us. And in terms of you know, how we proceed, I've been of the view that we need more units, we need greater density, because if you have more units, you have the foundation for having more affordable units. There are those, however, who argue that you shouldn't have more units because they're just going to go, uh, you know, to um, people of high incomes and make uh, affordable housing even more problematic. I don't think that's so. I think you have the foundation with more units and then you use the tools to get affordable housing that I'm uh, eagerly awaiting the discussion tonight about. So uh, you have great a group of people, a great panel, and I think the conversation will be uh, really worthwhile. And at that, I will ask, you know, that uh, uh, David, if you're taking control here, if we can uh, move on to people who are going to talk about these tools that we desperately need. Thank you. Stan Wall now. Welcome, Stan. All right. Let me try to share my screen here. And present. Uh, so, good evening. My name is Stan Wall. I'm a partner at HRNA Advisors, uh, a real estate development economic development firm here in Washington, D.C., uh, where I focus on urban revitalization, affordable housing, transit oriented development, and many other areas of making our city work better for everyone like us who live within it and who wish to be successful and thrive. Uh, I am joined this evening by three other great panelists, and I'll introduce each one of them to you in turn. Um, actually, I need to stop sharing for one moment, um, just so I can see my notes. Let's see. Our, our first panelist is Tracy Lowe. Uh, Tracy is a fellow with the Ann and Robert Bass Center for Transformative 
placemaking at Brookings. Uh, her research focuses on commercial real estate and how place level assets interact and affect the prospects of resilience and the people and enterprises that call a place home in urban, suburban, real, real, rural settings. Uh, Tracy recently wrote about the need to reform the real estate sector, including who benefits from new development and the governance challenges that exacerbate the extreme and growing spatialization of inequality in U.S. metro regions. Prior to joining Brookings, Tracy was a senior data scientist at the Center for Real Estate and Urban Analysis at the George Washington University School of Business. Uh, she was also previously the director of research at the Rails to Trails Conservancy. Tracy currently serves as the chair of Greater Greater Washington, where I have the pleasure to serve alongside her as, as a member of the board of directors. Uh, she is also a resident of Ward 3, and she grew up here in Ward 3, so she is very much connected to the issues that we will be discussing this evening. Our next panelist is Director Andrew Trueblood, uh, Director of the DC Planning Office since 2018. Uh, during his tenure, Andrew has prioritized agency efforts around housing and equity. He has shepherded the update of the comp plan with a focus on updates around housing, equity, resilience, public facilities, and COVID-19 recovery. Uh, this unprecedented effort included the engagement of over 10,000 residents and stakeholders through many means. Uh, during his time, the Office of Planning has also helped to support Mayor Bowser's historic housing efforts, including her goal of 36,000 new units of housing by 2025, including 12,000 affordable units. Prior to joining the Office of Planning, Andrew was Chief of Staff at the DC Office of De Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development. I first met Andrew when, he was a, when I was a consultant at JLL and he was working at the DC Housing Authority, uh, where we worked together on getting the Capra Carrollsburg Public Housing Project off the ground. So Andrew's dedication toward advancing affordable housing you know, dates back all the way to the beginning of his career, and it's great to see him still, you know, leading this charge with us here this evening. Our final panelist is Patrick McEnany. Uh, Patrick is a project manager at Somerset Development, a socially responsible real estate development company that focuses on expanding affordability and vitalizing communities. Patrick works on development projects, new pipeline opportunities, and public policy issues in Washington, D.C. His experience includes financial and economic analysis, project operations management, and urban planning. Uh, but before joining Somerset in 2019, Patrick worked as an economics researcher for 1776, a local civic tech start startup incubator, as a downtown uh, project in Las Vegas project manager, as well as an operations manager for a social enterprise in Brazil. Uh, so very excited to have all of these panelists with us. Uh, you'll hear from them and myself uh, very different perspectives around affordable housing tools and the challenges we're trying to overcome the role of the city and land use policy, and very specifically how a developer has applied these tools uh, toward implementation. With that, I will turn over to our first panelist, Tracy Lowe, uh, to walk us through where we stand today with affordable housing. Thanks, Dan. Okay, um, we are very fortunate tonight to be joined by two uh, real estate subject matter experts who know a ton about affordable housing in Stan and Patrick. So I'm gonna keep it quick and I'm gonna give a non-housing economist perspective on what affordable housing is and what it means for Ward 3. And I will just say right off the top that um, this version of the slides that I'm gonna show right now is not annotated with the sources of the graphs that I'm pulling in part because I wanted to be able to show the graph as graphs as big as possible so that people could see them. But I will make an annotated version of these slides available to our host tonight to share with everyone um, in case anyone is interested in reading more about any of the things that I'm just going to touch on at a very high level tonight. And I just really appreciate everyone tuning in tonight um, to learn about this important topic. Okay, so let's see if I can get these slides going. Okay. So uh, what I'm showing on this slide is a map of the United States and each bubble is a metropolitan area in the US. And what we see on this graph is that most cities in the US, most regions in the US um, do not have an affordable housing problem. Uh, this is looking at the cost of home ownership specifically and uh, you know, clearly there are different affordability issues for owners, owner occupants versus renters. And I'll talk a little bit about those later on in this presentation. 
Um, but what we see here is, uh, you know, the a majority of people in the United States are homeowner of households are um, homeowners. And so we see here is in most places, um, housing is um, pretty affordable. And frankly, if anything, uh, in danger of actually being uh, of, of being an asset that doesn't actually hold its value over time. So most places in the United States have the opposite dynamic going on um, versus what we have in the DC area. I'm showing the DC region with this giant blue arrow. We can see that our price to income ratio is very high. Um, that means that um, most people in the DC area have to put a, a, a higher amount of, uh, of their income into buying a house in order to get one. And that um, really the only reason regions in the US where housing is more expensive are New York, um, the major metros of California, and uh, a few islands in Hawaii. So it's, it's pretty expensive here in terms of the housing market. And this is probably something that don't, everyone already knew, but it's always helpful to see where our region is relative to other regions. Um, even within this region, there is significant variation in terms of the cost of housing. And so looking within the District of Columbia, there are three basic housing markets that cover the city and that are distinguished by price. And so, you know, people talk about affordable housing, um, they use the same word affordability, but they use it to mean two different things. So in one sense, they use it in a relative sense in that if something, if one thing is less expensive than something else, it's, it's more affordable, it's relatively more affordable. But then they also use it in an absolute sense when talking about households that make a particular income and to, and to ask in an absolute sense um, whether housing is affordable for that level of income. So it's confusing sometimes to hear people talk about affordable housing because they use the same word to talk about these two different issues, one relative and one absolute. And you know, I think probably all the speakers will do that tonight. And, and that's, that's okay. It's just something to kind of keep your radar up for while you're trying to understand what folks are talking about. So what we see going on in terms of DC's three housing markets is we see one where uh, the median listing price is well over a million dollars. Uh, and then we see a, uh, a middle market. Um, this is in neighborhoods that are um, downtown Capitol Hill and just east of the park um, where median listing prices are just below a million dollars. And then we see um, uh, in Prince George's County and um, east of the river in, in DC that um, median listing prices are far lower. So these are, uh, these are really three very distinct markets. Um, they're distinct in along multiple measures, um, but the, what we're here to talk about tonight is prices. So I'm gonna come back to this map at the end of my presentation. So talking about affordability in relative terms, um, it, in some sense, it, in common sense tells us actually like Ward 3 can't be too expensive if plenty of people live here, right? There's, there are clearly people, including many of us on this call who can afford to live in Ward 3. That's something that's true. That said, the question is um, how many of those people are there and how many people are there who can't afford to live in Ward 3? Um, these are also important questions. And so generally speaking across the board for both renters and owners, we see that housing affordability is a bigger challenge, uh, the lower your income is. And so what this graph is showing is um, all American households by income divided into quintiles. And we can see that especially if you earn less than the median income, which would be the bottom two quintiles, that um, these households typically have to spend a really huge share of their income on housing. And that's strictly a problem because it means that there's less money left over for all of the other needs of life. So if we're in a situation where, for example, only people in the top income quintile can afford to live in Ward 3, um, that simply means that the majority of households are excluded from the neighborhood. And, you know, whether that's a desirable outcome or not, I think is one of the things that we're here to talk about tonight. So 
what do people do when housing gets too expensive? There are a lot of strategies that people pursue and I've outlined five here that are pretty common. So the first is to try to consume less housing. So for example, get a two bedroom house instead of a four bedroom house or get a studio apartment instead of a two bedroom apartment. Um, people can try to share housing. So whether that's um, you know, two roommates uh, sharing, that, sharing a two bedroom apartment or whether it's um, uh, you know, um, moving in with relatives uh, is another really common strategy. Um, people, can, people also try to consume lower quality housing. So um, most of the af most affordable housing in the United States is um, trailers and trailer parks. And so whether it's um, a housing that is older or housing that is in a, a, a mobile form um, or whether it is housing that is um, uh, deteriorating, um, that can be another way to deal with high housing costs. Um, another strategy that people use a lot um, when housing in a particular area is too expensive is to just go live somewhere else, um, to, to move further away. And so this is, this is something that I hear a lot when people are talking about how expensive housing is in Ward 3, that like neighborhoods in Ward 3 are, are super desirable, they're amazing. You know, like I wish I could live in Kalorama, but I can't afford it, so I don't live there. And that doesn't mean that anyone should feel sorry for me. So, you know, this, you know, to a, a certain extent is true. I don't think I've particularly done anything to deserve to live in Kalorama, but this becomes a problem when um, a really significant chunk of the population is pursuing the go live somewhere further away strategy. It means that you can end up with a region where uh, a really high share of people are um, commuting really long distances, which is uh, making climate change worse, making their quality of life really horrible, and um, uh, you know causing traffic congestion. So the there are limits to you know how viable. Um, going to live somewhere further away is. And it can cause some other problems too that I'll get into later. And then finally, um, another strategy that people use when housing gets too expensive is to give up on housing. And uh, maybe that means living in a car. Um, it might mean living on the street. And so reviewing these five strategies, I see kind of three takeaways that are, this is how I think about housing policy. And, um, you know, folks may not agree, but uh, I think, um, I, I think it'd be good if there was consensus that ideally no one used the last strategy. That's really a problem if there are people who do not have, who cannot afford any housing. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's a good idea to have people living in their cars or on the street. Um, to avoid that strategy, that means that the logical thing is to make the other strategies as viable as possible. And so anything that makes any of the other four strategies more viable you can think of it as an affordable housing strategy. And lastly, I think that um, Ward 3 has a role to play in all of these strategies, uh, except in the case of strategy five, I would say, uh, Ward 3's role is not to encourage people to give up on housing, but to help people um, who are in that situation. Okay, so now I'm just gonna skim you through how uh, Ward 3 is doing um, in terms of speaking to these different strategies. So is it possible in Ward 3 to um, reach affordability by consuming less housing? And the answer is that Ward 3 does have a really great housing mix when you compare it to other wards. So um, what I'm showing here is that uh, Ward 3 is a really healthy mix of single family homes, apartments, condominiums, and other housing types. And you know this is this is a great mix, and this kind of diversity of choices is a good thing, and it's a good thing to try to maintain. The one thing that I would flag here is that Ward Three is, in terms of the residential land area of the ward, a really big ward. It's, it's significantly bigger than Wards One and Two, for example, in terms of um, how much land area it has, and yet Ward Two has more housing units. And so just from the perspective of efficiency, um, I think 
while the mix here is great, Ward 3 is underperforming in terms of uh, the total amount of inventory relative to other wards. Okay, um, what about sharing housing as an affordability strategy? This is a strategy that I personally have used a lot. Um, and what I'm showing on this graph is a bunch of different metro areas in the United States. And uh, I'm gonna explain how to read this graph in order to understand um, what the idea of sharing housing means. So what we see on the Y axis in this graph is the percentage capacity filled of different size housing units. And uh, the different size housing units, sorry, is the X axis. So, and the Y axis is percentage capacity filled. So I made these graphs by assuming that the capacity of a bedroom is 1.5 people. So that's just a statistical way of assuming that some people are sharing and some people aren't, but like definitely at least some people are sharing. So, so what we see here, for example, is if we look in the upper left-hand corner, which is the New York metropolitan area, you can see that um, all the one bedroom units in New York have approximately 1.5 people living in them. So that is, that's a lot of sharing. But if we look at houses that have four or more bedrooms, we can see that the capacity filled is um, closer, much closer to 50%, which means that there is less than one person per bedroom. Okay, so I, I realize that the, I don't expect everyone to like look at every grid on this graph and get all the takeaways here. So instead, I want us to just skip now to looking at, uh, looking at DC, which is in the second row, second cell in. This pattern is pretty similar to New York. So it's, it's okay that we're looking at this one right after that. But the, basically the key takeaway here is that while one bedrooms are shared pretty efficiently, every other size unit, two bedrooms, three bedrooms and four plus bedrooms, um, we are looking at a situation where um, across the pool of inventory of these units, um, there are a lot of empty bedrooms that don't have anyone in them. It's just sharing is, is not a super efficient affordability strategy, whether it's because people don't like it or just it's logistically hard to do. Um, you know, what we see in the data is that um, this is, it's not, it's not super viable and people are having a hard time with it here in this region and in most other places outside of California where the housing crisis is so bad that people have learned how to get better at it. Okay, so another strategy is to consume uh, lower quality housing. And I, I don't mean the phrase lower quality in a pejorative way. Like for example, like I've spent most of my life living in household, houses that are over a hundred years old. And those are sometimes cheaper houses to live in because they're older and, uh, and they don't have all the bells and whistles like closets. <laughs> and so um, Ward 3 has a lot of old inventory. So uh, Ward 3 has the highest share of apartments in the city, for example, that are, um, that are under rent stabilization. And rent stabilization only applies to, apartment, uh, to older apartment buildings. And so that figure kind of right away off the get-go tells us that um, that Ward 3's inventory is, um, is, is old. So that, you know, that tells us a couple things that we haven't built as many new apartments in recent years as other parts of the city, but also that this is a viable strategy for finding relatively more affordable housing in Ward 3, that you can just get an older apartment. The issue with these apartments being subject to rent stabilization is that typically in the literature, we find that the tenants in rent stabilized apartments are less likely to move. And so, you know, for kind of obvious reasons. And so this means that if you are a new renter who wants to move to Ward 3, it might be kind of tricky to find an apartment because most of the apartments are rent stabilized and the tenants in them are less likely to move and free up a space for you. So, you know, in Ward 3, you, we have kind of ended up with a housing situation where 
if, uh, because we're not adding that much new housing, if a person wants to move to Ward 3, they're essentially waiting for someone to die, which is not great in a growing region. Um, I, uh, I, I wouldn't call it like a, a welcoming strategy. So the last strategy that I talked about was um, moving further away. And this is what people are doing in large part if they want to live in Ward 3, but they can't, uh, they can't afford it. So um, because people can't afford housing in Ward 3, they might move um, further out into the Maryland and Virginia suburbs, but they are also um, looking at housing on the other side of the park. And that's putting additional gentrification pressure on those neighborhoods. That was the finding of a report by the DC Policy Center that looked at um, the full inventory of all housing units in DC. They, uh, because DC has uh, an unusually high number of um, households with just one or two people that have um, very high um, incomes, uh, those smaller households have the income uh, to be able to compete directly with um, bigger households that need more space. And so that puts a dish that limits the, the inventory that, that, um, that bigger households can find. And so to explain that, I'm gonna show you this chart um, from an office of planning report. So what I'm showing on this chart is that, um, uh, so uh, me the median income is the income by in, in a region where half of the households in the region make more than that, and then half of the households make less. So in the DC area, the median income um, for a household of one is about $85,000. So, um, so what I'm showing here is that um, uh, when we use median income as, a, as an absolute standard to talk about, to benchmark the affordability of housing, um, we might say that uh, uh, the DC Policy Center did some math here to say that like, okay, if a house um, is affordable to a household that makes, um, if, a, if a house would cost less than a third of the income of a, of a, a, house, a household with four people in it that earns um, up to $151,000, then if, if, it, if it takes less than a third of their income, then it counts as affordable. So um, the key thing to note here is that that's, that standard is different for households of different sizes. So um, the, the level, the, the amount of money that you can, that, that a household needs to spend on housing, obviously it depends on how big the household is and, and how, many, uh, how many bedrooms they need. And so the standard of affordability for um, bigger households is higher than it is for smaller households. So the DC Policy Center just looked at the price of every house in DC and they mapped where um, the houses are that are in the kind of Goldilocks spot in between um, these two income thresholds. So where are the houses that are affordable to households that make more than $105,000? Uh, and then where where are the houses that are that are affordable to households that make one hundred and fifty one thousand two hundred dollars or less? So looking for the, these two income thresholds, that's what's shown on this map. Okay, and so this is um, this is what's happening to um, household. This is these are this is basically a map of the neighborhoods of houses that earn around slightly more, slightly less than the area median income, but that have children. Um, once you wipe out the inventory that they are competing for uh, uh, against smaller households, this is the inventory that's less. And so this is why um, many young families that are trying to buy houses in the district are ending up in the neighborhoods that you see lit up on this map right now. And to flip back to the previous map, you can see that there is extremely strong overlap between the kind of middle priced gentrifying neighborhoods of the city and this map. So that's what's driving that dynamic. And so I make this point just to point out that one, I think for, the, for understanding um, Stan and Patrick's discussion, it'll be good for you guys to understand this idea of the area median income 
and then the different uh, um, segments above and below it. Um, but also just to point out that even housing that is market rate housing um, that that is not uh, that is that is targeted at households that earn approximately the median income, in a way, building that kind of housing still speaks to uh, the affordability strategy that I just described, the go away affordability strategy, because it gets at this issue of um, displacing people into other neighborhoods. So the takeaways here for me are that segregated housing produces other segregated incomes and a segregated society. If you think that having a segregated society is a bad thing, then we have to do something about the really extreme um, price segregation that we see in the DC housing market right now. Housing costs are rising everywhere in the region for homeowners and it's getting particularly extreme right now. So now is a good time to act. And then housing affordability means different things to different people. And all of those perspectives are, I think, useful to consider. I don't think there is any one um, category of housing affordability um, that is uh, necessarily uh, the most important. Just my point of view. Um, and then I offer three more takeaways that I think would be fun to discuss tonight um, when we get to it, um, that our area is growing. Our area is actually growing a lot. and so. It just helps to build more housing of all kinds, um, you know, when you're in a situation where you're adding a lot of jobs and households. And it's, uh, but we have finite resources um, to help people who can't afford housing. So it's helpful to have the market house as many people as possible. And, uh, you know, for uh, those who cannot be housed by the market, and there will always be some of those people, um, fortunately, there are a lot of policy tools, but they're really hard to use. And so Stan and Patrick are going to explain that, um, but that should be a, uh, a choice of last resort um, for the people who need it most. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I will pick right up on there with a discussion of what's in the affordable housing toolkit. And I made the mistake of having probably way too many slides in my slide deck. Um, so I might move fairly quickly, uh, but a reminder that this presentation is being recorded. It will be available on, on the website as well as the individual presentation. So if you ever do wanna go back and, and study any of what we presented tonight, uh, you'll have a chance to do so. Um, so this is uh, again, building inclusivity in Word 3, what's in the affordable housing toolkit. Um, the picture on the, this image is actually a building called the Brandywine. Um, this is in my single member district in 3F04. Uh, it is one of those buildings that Tracy mentioned that is a rent controlled building. It was built before 1975. Um, it is fairly affordable, but the, the, the one bedroom apartments in this building, you know, if you're leasing today, go for $1,700, uh, which means that you need an income of at least $70,000 to comfortably afford that unit. And that actually means that there's a lot of people in this community that work in this community who could not live in this building that presumably is one of those naturally occurring affordable units. Diving into the, my discussion this evening, we'll, we'll run through affordable housing issues, picking up on some of the points that Tracy raised earlier. Uh, I'll introduce the, the general buckets of affordable housing tools. Uh, I'll walk through an, a housing development framework that connects housing finance to housing costs to rents. I'll show how these types of tools are applied in each step of the process. And finally, a quick summary to tee up uh, Patrick to walk us through how this, this works in practice. Um, affordable housing issues. You know, the problem we're trying to solve here, again, as Tracy walked us through, uh, it's a myriad set of issues. It's you know, rental affordability in terms of people of all income levels being able to afford their rent. Housing supply, is there enough housing? to meet demand, uh, housing stability. Uh, can people stay in their homes if they want to? Uh, gentrification, uh, this has occurred across Washington, DC. And as a result of gentrification, increasing prices, you know, people being displaced from their homes. Sorry about that. Uh, home ownership, understanding that people face barriers to building assets through home ownership. Housing quality, is housing safe and decent? Um, do people have equitable access to employment, transit, schooling, healthcare, and other needs? Uh, otherwise categorized as access to opportunity. Uh, which is something that you know being here in Ward 3 uh, would afford people that, that great access. Racial equity, uh, can people access and afford the same housing regardless of their racial identity? Uh, 
are older populations able to safely and affordably remain in their homes? And finally, do vulnerable populations need services to reduce the risk of homelessness or institutionalization? So the tools I'll talk about this evening won't address all of these. Uh, I'm very much focused on those tools that help to create production. And those tools that support affordable housing production fall into two main categories, um, land use tools and subsidy tools. Land use tools include using municipal regulations or zoning authority to indirectly approve affordability and increase the supply of housing or directly incentivize or require the production of affordable units. Subsidy, providing below market rate loans, grants, or other public resources that close the gap between what a household can afford to pay and the cost to develop and operate housing. As I go through the rest of this presentation, you'll see how the, the various tools fall within these two buckets. Looking at land use tools a little bit more closely, uh, indirect tools increase the overall supply of housing, reduce low or lower the cost of new housing. Uh, these tools include by right zoning, uh, building code reform, accessory dwelling units. Uh, direct tools create uh, affordable housing through incentives and other requirements for the production of affordable units, such as an expedited review for affordable housing projects or inclusionary zoning. Um, listed below are a handful of pros and cons of these various tools. Um, and again, in the interest of time, we'll move fairly quickly uh, to look at subsidy tools. Um, subsidy tools close the gap between what a household can afford and the cost of developing and operate housing. Um, capital subsidies are low interest, no interest debt and grants that help reduce the cost to develop and acquire housing. Operating subsidies and income assistance uh, support uh, lower affordable rent and housing. To understand how these tools are applied to the production of housing uh, requires a look at a, a housing development framework, essentially understanding you know, ultimately how housing of any type gets built. And there's four key elements of, of producing housing, uh, development costs, development funding, uh, otherwise known as uses and sources, um, operating expenses and revenue. Successful development depends on balancing development costs with development funding and balancing operating expenses with uh, revenue. Rent is you know, ultimately what comprises revenue. And the, for a project to be successful, rent must cover operating expenses, inclusive of property management, property taxes, uh, debt service on any debt on a project, as well as the return on equity to the investors in that same project. When we introduce affordable housing into a project, it reduces rent. Uh, reducing rent creates a revenue gap compared to operating expenses. And at this point, this type of project is not feasible because there is no developer who's going to build a project where their rent cannot cover the cost of operating that project and the cost of financing that project. And we have a revenue gap. With reduced revenue, banks and investors are willing to invest less in a project, then creating a development funding gap. So not only do we have a revenue gap where we can't cover operating expenses, but because of our reduced rent, we can't get as much debt or equity as we would like on our project. And as a result, we don't have enough funding to cover the cost of building that project. So again, we have both the development funding gap and a revenue gap, both of which make it impossible for a project like this to, to advance. Unless this development gap and revenue gap can be closed, the project will be infeasible and it will not get built. This is where tools come in. Housing affordability development tools um, go toward every step of this process. Uh, the goals of tools for development costs is to lower the cost of land, lower the cost of soft cost or hard cost of a project. Um, by definition, hard costs include uh, labor and materials that go into constructing the building. Uh, soft costs include entitlements and permitting of a project. And land costs is you know, self-explanatory in terms of the cost of the land on which a project is built. Um, debt, is debt is funding that you borrow from a bank to build a project. Equity is the additional funding that's put up by the developer or the developer's uh, investors uh, to close the remaining funding for the project. To apply the tools to each of these areas, I'm going to walk through each component, you know, starting with development cost. And there are, are several key tools that, if applied toward development costs, can help bring down the cost of a project and thus you know, help make affordable housing production uh, possible. Um, the first tool is public land, uh, and that essentially, you know, focuses on the land cost component. And by able to being able to write down the value of public land in exchange for the provision of affordable housing, again, creates value that can be invested into affordable housing units. Uh, accessory dwelling units 
Uh, it's also, you know, somewhat related to land costs in terms of, you know, it allows for, you know, existing homes or existing buildings uh, to create additional units on that existing property uh, and incentivizing additional living quarters on single family lots separate from the primary home. This can be English basement rentals, it can be carriage houses or other types of, of additional units on a property. Uh, reduced fees, uh, reduction or elimination in entitlement fees, community benefits or other proffers helps to reduce the soft costs on the project. Again, ultimately reducing overall development costs. Uh, accelerated approval. Uh, in the development process, time is money. Uh, expediting approval can reduce the delivery time, creating development cost savings. Again, that can fund affordable housing. Um, similarly, buy right development uh, creates certainty in the development process. Uh, certainty saves time, and by virtue of that, saves money in the development process. And finally, flexible design standards. Providing relief to design standards, such as reducing parking, as an example, um, very directly reduces project cost, um, particularly in the realm of project hard cost. And I'll say for, for these development cost tools, as well as all the other tools, uh, these lists aren't exhaustive. Uh, these are some of the most popular and prevalent tools, uh, but there are many, many other tools that can be applied to, to these, these uh, elements. The next tool looks at development funding. Uh, development funding, again, is the debt and equity and, and other capital that goes into actually covering the cost, soft cost, hard cost, and land cost of building a project. Uh, some of the more popular tools here in the district that go toward supporting uh, additional development funding including use of the Housing Production Trust Fund, uh, a revenue fund administered by DHCD here in DC that provides gap financing for projects. I think Stan lost his audio. Stan, would you like us to jump to Patrick's presentation or do you, do you feel reconnection is imminent? You can let us know in the chat. I think you may not be able to hear the answer, so. Oh no, poor guy. <laughs> I will just go ahead. Sorry. Oh, hang on. That's him in the waiting room. I just admitted him. All right. Sorry about that all. I'll get back on to my presentation. Um, so I left off talking about development funding tools before my, my audio dropped out. Uh, again, the, the tools, Housing Production Trust Fund, uh, Low Income Housing Tax Credits, or LIHTC, uh, uses gap financing other support to increase production of housing support of housing. 9% um, credits and 4% credits. And essentially these are funding tools that are based on selling uh, to other investors as a benefit of investing in affordable housing. Uh, tax increment financing uh, that allows the DC government to sell bonds backed by a portion of development future property sales tax with the bond money helping to pay developer construction costs. Uh, another similar tool is the payment of those taxes uh, where property tax payments are redirected to bond service uh, to support development infrastructure. Again, both of these tools go toward reducing the hard costs of the project. Uh, there's corporate and philanthropic funding. Uh, this can be comprised of below market loans, a grant supported by a corporation or philanthropic organization. Some examples here in our region include the Washington Housing Initiative Impact Pool uh, that was funded by JBG, uh, Amazon's Housing Equity Fund, Kaiser Permanente's private community funds, all of which go toward uh, creating and preserving affordable housing. And finally, there's a whole basket of federal loan and grant programs uh, administered by FHA and other agencies that provide lower cost financing for the production and preservation of affordable housing. Looking at our next set of tools, uh, operating expenses, uh, two of the most popular, actually one of the most popular in this area is property tax abatement. 
uh, which involves waiving all or a portion of property taxes for a defined period of time in exchange for that project providing affordable units. Uh, another tool that is used a little bit less frequently is the Landlord Risk Fund. Uh, this is a tool that incentivizes landlords to accept tenant-based vouchers, and it reduces their costs by helping to cover unpaid security deposits and back rent if needed. And then looking back at the prior slide of the, of the various financing tools, uh, many of those tools not only fill funding gaps, but they also reduce, uh, result in a lower cost uh, of operating costs as a result of lower interest rates or replacement of equity, which is very expensive to a project with debt, which is relatively uh, less expensive than, than equity financing. The, the final uh, area is looking at rent tools, revenue tools. Um, the first one, inclusionary zoning, which Director Trubo will be talking about later, is a program that offers incentives or density bonuses in exchange for the provision of affordable housing as a part of market rate development projects. Uh, the additional rent from these market rate units uh, offset, ideally, the lost rent uh, from affordable units. I mentioned ideally because in a lot of cases, you know, given the rapidly spiraling construction cost environment that we're in today, um, it can sometimes be difficult for even those additional market rate units to truly offset the lost rent from the affordable units. You know, so sometimes those programs need to be tweaked somewhat to make sure that the incentive is strong enough to still create uh, those affordable units. Uh, Tenant-based vouchers help to supplement rent uh, in the revenue equation by providing tenants with long-term vouchers that subsidize rent uh, for them to live in market rate units. Um, the challenge with tenant-based vouchers is there's a limited supply and a long waiting list for those vouchers, um, a very constrained supply of, of vouchers that exist um, here in DC. Similarly, project-based vouchers provide projects with long-term vouchers that subsidize rent for market rate units. These are even in a more limited in supply than the tenant-based vouchers. So looking back at our, our challenge where we had a revenue gap and development funding gap, you know, if you look at development costs and, and if we're able to reduce land costs by writing down land value, uh, reduce soft costs perhaps by expediting the process, uh, reduce hard costs by having you know, flexibility on parking, you know, that can bring down development costs to a point where they match the available funding. Looking across the, the other part of the chart, you know, if we're able to close this revenue gap um, by having lower cost of financing and thus lower debt service, uh, perhaps having a partial tax abatement, uh, that helps to make sure that operating expenses are in line with rent. And, and what's critical in discussing that is, is the fact that you'll need to layer all these tools. Um, there's no one single tool that operates as a you know, silver bullet uh, for making housing feasible. It often requires one, two, three, four or more of these tools layered together uh, to make affordable housing projects possible. In summary, Successful housing development requires a balancing of development costs and funding, a balancing of operating expenses and revenues. All of these are interconnected. Um, housing development is hard, particularly given our current environment in, of high construction costs, and affordable housing development is even harder. Affordable housing tools can help reduce difficulty and increase housing production by creating value that offsets the cost of those affordable units. No single tool is a perfect solution. Success relies upon layering of the most appropriate tools to match each opportunity. We'll now turn it over to Patrick to walk us through how this actually works in practice uh, on a real development project. Thank you. Great, thanks, Dan. Uh, I know we're a little behind schedule, so I'm gonna try and talk uh, quickly here. Uh, basically, I'll go over kind of the actual affordable housing developer perspective. I work for Somerset, we're a Friendship Heights based affordable housing developers. So this is an issue that's very near and dear to our heart. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about kind of what makes Ward 3 hard to actually acquire sites for affordable housing, uh, and then go through kind of some examples of the financing tools that Stan talked about, and then trying that con to connect that to the challenge in Ward 3 of high uh, land prices and what that means for zoning strategies. So to understand how affordable housing normally works in DC, there's basically three traditional approaches that developers take. One bucket is preservation projects. A lot of that is done through DC's unique Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, where tenants get a chance to buy a building or assign it to another developer when it's put up for sale. And a lot of those projects are about preserving existing affordable housing in the face of cost pressures. There's another bucket that affordable housing developers looked at, which are kind of city facilitated projects, most often when the city actually owns the land itself and can control the process of selling it to a developer to add affordable housing. And then the third, which has also uh, been a pretty robust history in DC, 
is socially minded landowners. That's particularly true historically in the city with the faith community, with a lot of uh, churches and houses of worship that have owned land and essentially donated that land at below market value to support affordable housing projects in the past. So in Ward 3, obviously, we don't have a lot of affordable housing to begin with. On uh, these charts, you can see one is a, a chart of the subsidized affordable housing in the city. And you can see there's very little uh, so far uh, west of the park. And also on the right, you can see, zooming out a bit, a distribution of where the Section 8 housing is in, in the uh, DMV. And you can see there's very little here. So the challenge is when you have kind of preservation focus, you're not really touching Ward 3 because you can't really preserve something that doesn't exist in the first place. There are some unique opportunities for city-owned land. I think that's some of the kind of exciting opportunities that exist in Ward 3. But as you can see from looking at this map uh, pulled from the future land use map, the very dark blue is city-owned properties. And there are a few sites uh, here and there, but not that much in the grand scheme of things. So there's only so much land that the city owns that it can uh, put up for affordable housing projects. There's obviously a lot more land in private hands, and there are some opportunities for kind of socially minded landowners. But as you can imagine, as anyone who kind of owns property knows, it, it takes a lot to ask someone to sell their property to discount. Most landowners want to sell their price at the market price. So that also limits the opportunities that are available from the traditional approaches. When properties do come on the market, uh, the competition is very intense and it moves very fast. And so there's kind of a very quick churn when a lot of developers are competing to the high land prices here uh, that makes it very hard to secure those properties in a short period of time when you have to line up all those complicated tools that Stan talked about. So one opportunity for actually getting affordable housing in Ward 3 is essentially good old fashioned cold calling, right? Finding the unique opportunities that we think exist and reaching out to those landowners to put in unsolicited, unsolicited offers while recognizing that you're gonna to have to, in most scenarios, pay the market rate price to the land. If you're calling someone up and asking if they're interested in selling their land, most of them are gonna expect uh, it to be at regular market value. So that's really the approach that we have to take if we wanna actually do affordable housing projects. I'll talk a little about the tools, but I think Stan covered a lot of this. The basics to understand is that like when you buy a home, you put down a down payment and you take out a mortgage, that's the bulk of how we finance new projects in the city with debt and equity. With debt, when you have affordable housing, you can only take out a smaller mortgage. So that's one challenge based on lower income. And then on equity, the returns that investors will demand versus just putting their money into the stock market are usually too high to work for an affordable housing project. And so instead, what affordable housing developers tend to use uh, is another tool Stan mentioned called low income housing tax credits. And I want to emphasize this is the biggest program now in the country for affordable housing. It's larger than Section 8 vouchers that move with tenants, larger than Section 8 vouchers that are tied to buildings, larger than public housing. It's a program where private investors put money into affordable housing in exchange for a reduction in their corporate taxes. And it's rapidly growing and will continue to become the largest uh, federal investment tool for affordable housing. It's worth noting that this program incentivizes affordable housing in high uh, opportunity areas like Ward 3, where there's actually a boost to the amount uh, by 30% of the credits that a project can generate when it's in an affluent area. It's important to recognize that even with using tax credits as a tool, as Dan mentioned, it's usually not enough to fill the gap that you need, and you need to look for other uh, sources of financing to support you. And so basically, an affordable housing project will look something like this. It's similar to what Stan showed before. You'll have on your right all of your costs to buy the land, to build the building, to pay the architect, to pay all the financing fees, to pay the developer. And then on the left, you'll have the debt you take out from a bank, the tax credits you raise from the investor through this program. And then you're still going around and looking for other opportunities like a second mortgage from DC's Housing Production Trust Fund. And your goal is to get enough funding, obviously, to pay your costs. I'll walk through an example of how this actually works in practice so you can kind of see uh, what these numbers mean. I hear a lot what does it take to get affordable three bedroom apartments, really affordable family size units in Ward 3 that we know are so key to providing economic opportunity uh, and racial equity in the city. So I'm just walk through an example. Let's imagine a thousand square foot three bedroom apartment. That's at 50% of very median income. Let's assume it's a lower uh, rise. It's a wood frame apartment. You're just building with stick. It's four story. You'll get a, a operating subsidy from the city, a hundred percent of tax abatement. The city gives for nonprofit uh, projects that have uh, LIHTC equity in them. And let's imagine in theory 
the acquisition cost is free. You're not paying anything from the land. Maybe it's the city's giving it away for free. So based on that, you're gonna have a fixed rent. Uh, based on 50% limit, it'll be 1,670 a month. You deduct some amount out for what the tenant pays in utility. You assume your uh, operating expenses, and then you get an income of about $11,000 per year for the single apartment. Now, let's imagine your construction costs are about $205 a square foot. That used to be the case. It's actually gone up a lot because the price of wood has shot up so much during the pandemic. You have contingency costs for any overruns that always happen. Like I said, you have to pay the architect, do all your permitting fees, pay all your financing costs. One problem with the tax credit program is there are a lot of transaction costs. And so that total comes out when you add all those costs in to about $300,000 to build that unit. Now, assuming that you have $11,000 in income based on a standard mortgage you could get, that will get you about $189,000 in the mortgage. The LIHTC equity is based on the cost of building, and it's a complicated calculation. I won't get into that, but that gets you another $82,000. And so as a result, you're at $272,000, which is not enough to cover the cost of building the building. So you have what we call an affordable housing development, a gap. And a lot of what we do as affordable housing developers is try and find the tools to fill that gap. And I should remind you, this is assuming you're getting the land for free. So once you add on the land costs, which normally get to $100,000 a unit in a hot market like DC, you're really looking at a gap like $129,000 a unit, which is about what the city often pays to developers in a second mortgage from the Housing Production Trust Fund to cover the costs and allow the project to move forward. So the key takeaway, it costs more to build an affordable three bedroom apartment than the unit earns in rent to pay for its uh, construction. And so that's a really hard challenge that we have to work with. So I wanna tie this back into zoning and land valuation a bit. The key thing to understand about land value, it works a little bit different than say manufacturing of, of cars because uh, where you have you know, an infinite number of cars you can produce. A single piece of land can only be one single thing. And so when you have multiple projects bidding on a land, only one gets selected. And this is when we get into something we call highest and best use in determining the value of the land. So if you imagine all of your inputs are fixed, the construction cost to build the project, the rents you'll be able to get, the expenses, the land price is actually the output that gets spit out in the model. It's what you can afford to pay for the site. So if you imagine three different buildings, a market rate apartment, an office building, and a factory, they all put in their construction costs, they all put in their rents and expenses into the model, and they spit out a land value. And in this scenario, the market rate pays 5 million, the office building pays four, the factory pays two, the land price then becomes $5 million. The highest and best use is to build a market rate apartment. And then all those other projects, the office building or the factory, they have to take that $5 million and put it into a fixed, it now becomes a fixed input in their model and suddenly the model doesn't work. So they become financially unviable. This is really key to also understand why missing middle uh, housing at you know 80% to 100% of every median income doesn't get produced in DC right now. If you imagine three similar projects, they're all in the same building, but they're offering three different levels of rents, uh, kind of a higher uh, rent level, a median rent level, and a lower rent, rent level. You assume all your other inputs are held constant, the cost of building the building, your interest rates, the equity return that investors demand. Mm -hmm. What you find, and these are actual numbers I ran, is that the first project can pay 17 million for the land. The second project can pay 5 million. The third project, can't pay anything. Similar to the example I gave you, it has a negative value and so gap financing is needed. So as a result, what happens is the land becomes worth $17 million, only project one becomes viable. And so project two, even if you're a well-intentioned developer trying to build some cheaper housing, when you have to take that land value and plug it into your model, it doesn't work. And so the only scenario where this project can get forward at those lower rents, if you're not using these other tools, is if the owner is selling the land at a discount uh, which is, again, as I mentioned, something that kind of rarely happens. So it's really key to understand why we're not seeing cheaper market rate housing getting built. There's enough demand at that higher level that it freezes out all the other development below it. And so the really high-end projects can outbid everything else for the land. And so here's where zoning comes into play. When you have zoning that limits what can be built on a site, you're actually restricting what the highest and best use can be. So if you imagine, say, a home that could pay uh, just $2 million, it's a you know, very uh, expensive single-family home, but an apartment project on that site could pay $10 million. In theory, you could say the land value is $10 million, 
But if it's zoned only for the single family home, it's actually only worth 2 million. So what's unique about upzoning is it actually allows you to unlock land value. Like if you were to upzone that home to allow the apartment building, you're creating $8 million in land value because the land value is now gone from 2 million to 10 million. And so this is where you have an opportunity to get very creative. You can upzone to unlock this land value and then use it to invest in affordable housing. And then you're not competing directly and you can start to actually bring additional resources to bear. So if you imagine a single family home that was worth 2 million, as I said, a, a, you know, high end luxury building that could pay 10 million and let's say affordable apartments using the low income housing tax credits could pay 4 million. If you upzone the parcel, but only allowed affordable units in this example, the land becomes worth 4 million. The affordable project is now financially feasible because it's not competing with a $10 million project. The trick is this is very hard to standardize because all of your inputs are going up and down over time. Construction costs change, interest rate change. So it's very hard to fix this and make it work perfectly. But that's kind of the idea. And the example I just want to touch on real fast is when we actually did this for a project down on U Street called Portner Place. These were 48 Section 8 garden style apartments and the landowner Lord was putting them up for sale. And there was a risk that the low-income housing uh, was going to be lost. The tenants were going to be displaced. And so we partnered with the tenant association to come up with a preservation project. The land value was very, very high. So it was challenging to come up with the tools. So we had to get a little creative. So instead of just going out and asking the city for a big subsidy to make up the difference, what we did was subdivided the lot and sold half of it to a market rate developer that we upzoned to a taller building than was allowed matter of right using a planned unit development. And that created a subsidy that we were then from the land sale to reinvest in building a new all affordable unit, including full one for one replacement of the existing units, allowing those families to stay in their community long term and adding new affordable housing while also building some market rate housing to deal with the broader supply questions that Tracy was talking. So by using the PUD process, we were able to increase the land value enough that it funded the acquisition. We matched the market rate offer. We were able to subsidize again the affordable building and go from 48 affordable units to a mix of market rate and affordable units in a high demand area. So that's basically the idea of how you can kind of use upzoning creatively to finance affordable housing projects. So as I mentioned, Ward 3 is very challenging to do the site acquisition, especially given the high land values. We do have unique tools in DC that are available to us and tools that we can really uh, count on to push forward in, in Ward 3. Uh, but we do have opportunities by being very creative with our upzoning. But it's important to realize if you're doing a cold call and just buying a property from someone at market rate, and then you're having to run that risk of the period to upzone it, to line up all those financing tools, it's a very, very high risk activity. And so you need to have a lot of substantial community buy-in and support to make uh, this model work. But we're hopeful that there are opportunities for us and other affordable housing developers uh, to start adopting these strategies and really start to make a difference uh, in actually getting affordable housing built in Ward 3. Our final panelist is Director Trublet. Uh, Andrew, take it away. Great. Well, where, let me turn on our video. Can you can you see my presentation? Hopefully. Uh, great. Uh, so I, I know we are running way over. I'm going to try and talk, maybe not quickly, but uh, but maybe I'll I'll blow, I'll go quickly through this. Um, we've talked about uh, the history of, of how we've gotten here as a city. I just want to point out uh, there were de facto segregation. Uh, we had um, covenants uh, based on race. We had underwriting based on race. Uh, this map looks very similar to what Tracy showed us earlier around some of the divides that you see around our city that, have, that are, are there today. And I think I just want to say that um, you know, the, the history is to, is today, right? We still see different outcomes, uh, even today. We've inherited this, um, whether you look at income, education, um, life expectancy, all, all of these are, 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 are gaps in our city and, and equity and racial gaps. I would say too, uh, it's why you see uh, the differential in, in uh, land prices that we see. And that's why we see more affordable housing uh, in, East of the river, it's it's less expensive there, and so when you're trying to minimize, when Stan's trying to minimize the gap, or when, when uh, you know when when organizations that Stan works works with try to minimize the gap, 
uh, they, one way to do that is to find the lowest land prices or where the district government owns land, which is typically in these areas. As you saw, we don't own a lot of land. The district does not own land uh, in Upper Northwest very much in, in, at any substantial amount. So, you know, these, all of these realities are, are, are the result of actions uh, de facto and de jure that took place over the last hundred years. Uh, and what we're talking about is how, what are the, what are the actions that we can take to, to dismantle that? What do we do? Um, one thing uh, that the mayor has done uh, is talk about, uh, create uh, goals, uh, bold goals around housing uh, for the whole city, 36,000 new housing units by 2025 and 12,000 affordable uh, that Patrick will build uh, and his friends. Uh, uh, and, and I think uh, what's important here is uh, to recognize what both Patrick and Tracy were saying, we need more housing uh, to address affordability, to address that, that broader question of what people can generally afford at, at various levels. And we need more housing in order to be able to build more of that affordable housing. If we can't build housing, we can't build affordable housing. Uh, housing is necessary, but not sufficient uh, to get subsidized housing, but it's also necessary uh, to ensure that uh, we can we can uh, keep prices uh, in line with the growth that we're experiencing. The mayor uh, signed a mayor's order that did a couple of things I think that are important. We've really been focusing on DC. I know there are a few slides about the region, but we're a regional housing market. Um, many people don't see uh, the lines, uh, the, the boundaries the same way that maybe I, I have to respect. Um, and so uh, the mayor directed us uh, to work uh, with the region where I worked with, I got to work, uh, David, with you uh, and, and other planning directors and housing directors uh, to say, what as a region do we need to do? We all need to build more housing. Uh, and on the right, you see uh, a, 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 a resolution that the Count Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments passed September of 2019, saying more 75,000 additional housing units over what we were projecting, at least 75% in transit rich areas and job rich areas like Ward 3, uh, and 75% should be affordable to uh, low and middle income um, households. Uh, we've seen this slide, uh, but it's worth saying, so the mayor asked us to zoom out and look at the region and actually look at the federal government and see what their role is uh, to, to uh, was that Patrick's slide that showed the different types of, 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 of subsidy. The federal government is the primary source of subsidy for affordability, but especially those deeply affordable units. We need them as a partner, talking to them, but also then zooming in. Uh, and let's look at where housing is in our city. It's not good enough just to have 36,000 and 12,000, but we have to look at where it is. Uh, and on this uh, map, you see where we have existing subsidized units left. Uh, and we created goals uh, to help cr uh, create uh, a city where there are subsidized opportunities across the city. Uh, and, and with the goal of by 2050, at least every planning area having 15% of its stock affordable, these are numbers that we think we would have to achieve by 2025, uh, which is pretty ambitious. Uh, but we, you, if you don't have a goal, you won't hit it. Uh, and so this, this has been, uh, I think, an important goal that's driven a lot of our work, um, both at the Office of Planning and at the Department of Housing and Community Development. Um, uh, let's let's go briefly. Uh, the comp plan uh, update is happening now. It's before council. They marked it up last week. They'll vote on it for the first time next week. Uh, there's some major themes and updates, but I just want to highlight here housing uh, and equity are both critical. Uh, this is about how do we build more housing uh, and how do we build more equitable housing and how do and housing as, as kind of a critical piece of equity and outcomes in our city. Uh, you've hopefully seen some of these maps. Uh, this is the future land use map. It guides zoning. It is not zoning. Zoning is done by um, an independent five uh, person commission, uh, but this cannot be, it cannot be inconsistent with the comp plan, especially this future land use map that talks about general density, uh, type of land use. Uh, what we have done is propose creating more density along major corridors. Uh, in, across the city, but especially uh, in Ward 3, uh, that's transit oriented development. Um, and and it's high opportunity um, oper it's high opportunity uh, housing. Uh, it's worth saying on the left uh, we have some work to do uh, in the time that we uh, have have had these goals. Uh, you can see here by planning area Rock Creek West is similar is Ward Three essentially. Uh, how much uh, how much per what percentage of affordability we've achieved in each planning area. Uh, so we have some work to do here in Rock Creek West. I think what I would suggest is 
Uh, this isn't terribly surprising, uh, as, as I think you've seen. Uh, housing takes a long time. It takes a long time to turn that ship. It takes a long time to change land use, to change zoning, to build, build, to get the financing. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and we've had to do a lot of those changes, uh, or propose a lot of those changes. Council is only now acting uh, on, on the comp plan, uh, thanks uh, in part to, to efforts from uh, Council Member Che, who's really, I think, helped uh, improve the future land use map through some of her changes as well. So uh, that's what we're here for. Well, how do we how do we move that needle? Um, I, I want to mention a couple of tools. Uh, there is a, a pilot targeted tax abatement uh, for affordable housing in high opportunity areas. Uh, that's four of the highest opportunity planning areas in the city. Uh, right now, it's limited um, in the amount of money, but I think if it's successful, it's something that we would definitely be interested in, in growing, uh, especially if it can produce housing in these areas. Uh, we've expanded inclusionary zoning, which requires any building over nine units uh, to produce a certain percentage affordability uh, in exchange for a density bonus. So that stand, you know, it doesn't, you can't just require things. Uh, you, 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 if you do that, you throw off the, the numbers and you might actually not get any housing. Uh, so inclusionary zoning is about balancing, uh, still working to balance those, but on the private market. Uh, but what we said is where there's more density, we expect more affordability. So based on the additional density that you get, instead of producing eight to 12%, affordable units, uh, you would do between 12 and 20%, depending on how much digital density you might be able to unlock through uh, the upzoning. So sort of what Patrick was, was speaking to. Uh, we don't, you can't upzone only affordability. <laughs> that's not uh, that's not a tool that's possible, but you can upzone and, and ramp up some of the inclusionary uh, pieces. Uh, moreover, uh, to Patrick's point, if you can upzone uh, for those who are more mission driven, it gives them more um, income and more ability to cross subsidize those units. Uh, finally, it is worth mentioning, although uh, you know, we do have a local rent supplement voucher, you saw there's not many in Ward 3, but we have implemented over the last few years, well, we, there's more money uh, that's been, been, been put in recently, but we've also implemented rents based on uh, sub markets, basically, uh, which would allow more uh, residents to be able to afford maybe places up in Ward 3, especially if we can start layering that with things like inclusionary zoning. We've seen that to be actually a quite uh, interesting, a quite good match. Um, I know in the wharf, in fact, some of the, the of the of the affordable units are actually used by voucher holders. Uh, so you can get some of that deeper subsidy and those deeper affordability uh, that we need. Um, so I just want to say, uh, you know, I know we're we're really close to end, but but I, I have a, there's a lot of things I mentioned. Uh, there's a lot of of documents here for those who want to learn more. Uh, maybe this was just a, a, just a little bit, and you can also sign up on our newsletter. Um, on our website, if you want to follow the work we're doing, uh, um, we're out. Uh, we're out doing a small area plan in Chevy Chase right now. Uh, we're starting some work in Friendship Heights. Uh, we're, as as the council member mentioned, looking and seeing what Wardman uh, might be like. So we are we're actively um, working uh, on these efforts in Ward Three. Also, in other parts of the city, we we are working in Congress Heights and Pennsylvania Avenue and. Ward one. So we're not we're not just in Ward three, but I think we realize the importance of effort and energy uh, to to realize these goals, and it'll that it'll take a concerted effort on DC government's part. Uh, so I think with that, uh, I will turn it back to Stan. Thank you, Director Trueblood, for a great presentation, and a reminder again that all the presentation will be posted to the website, and this presentation is being recorded, so you can watch it later. Uh, we did receive a handful of questions. I do want to work through them fairly quickly if we can go to at least nine o'clock, if that's okay. Uh, I'll put the first question to Councilmember Che. I think uh, she is still with us. Uh, we had a question in the chat uh, asking about the Wardman project and a question about understanding what is what is the path toward putting public funding toward that project for affordable housing. You might be on mute, Councilmember. All I can say about it at this moment is I have, uh, and, and Andrew may have been, uh, I'll use the word lassoed into this. I sent a, a, a note to uh, the mayor asking her to have her team, which would be Andrew, et cetera, uh, to look at the possibilities of uh, acquiring some or all of that site and what we, what we might do with it. Uh, if it were acquired by private parties, then we would have to deal with the way the way we deal with uh, private ownership in general in terms of development and the tools that uh, we've gone over to, to get affordable housing. But 
uh, it's very preliminary and I don't have an Andrew, I don't know if you have any uh, specific information, more specific information, but that's really where we are. Um, I'll just say uh, you all saw the the um, headline. I think it was who's, was that Patrick? Was that your presentation about two hundred bidders expressed interest in the site? Uh, so when you think about highest and best use, uh, I think we are looking at a site that is is right now uh, appraised at one hundred and thirty million dollars, but likely going to be much more. Uh, appraisals are typically low, uh, so uh, that's just a lot of cash. Uh, just by comparison, we only put uh, about 130 uh, at the highest 130 million dollars in our housing production trust fund. Uh, and so I think what we, you know, we're, we're, we're we are tra tracking this. Uh, I think we're looking at how can we use those limited funds we have to, to support uh, affordability here. Um, I think it is a great opportunity for affordable housing um, and it'll just we'll need to figure out how how it all works uh, and, and how to, to make it work. But I think there's very much an interest uh, in, in uh, that, this opportunity. Uh, one other thing I'll just note, this site is particularly complex. Uh, there are a number of operating agreements and um, connections with, with the two uh, residential towers uh, that, make, uh, that make it all very complex in terms of what will happen in terms of renovation or redevelopment. Uh, and so we're trying to follow uh, what, what the different um, options are on that level as well. Great, thank you both. Uh, another question that we saw come through the chat, uh, and this is probably for, for Tracy, Patrick, and myself, uh, but what are the top two to three barriers to affordable housing uh, production in Ward 3? Uh, so maybe each one of us can give uh, one example of a, of a barrier to affordable housing in Ward 3. Patrick, you want to start? Yeah, sure. I can start. I think one of the challenges is uh, the interim acquisition period, right? So I mentioned that the strategy, if you don't already own the land, you have to get the land. And if you're going to get the land, you have to pay market price for it. And then, you know, even if you have all these tools, like the housing production trust fund, low income housing tax credit, those all take a lot of time to line up. So usually if the landowner is interested in selling quickly, then you basically have to hold the land you have to buy it at market value and hold it in an interim period before you're then doing your kind of full long-term financing strategy with the housing production trust fund and everything there. So I think one of the big challenges for affordable housing developers looking to go out and buy property in Ward 3 is how are you going to land up that interim period financing when you know it takes a longer time to put together uh, the public tools, any of the upzoning example I talked about, uh, which are kind of longer term plays. It's really a time question that we have to solve for. I have kind of a bigger picture perspective on it all, just having having looked at how development entitlements work in a lot of other cities in the United States. I think that um, uh, DC development entitlements, and by this I mean zoning, like what you're allowed to do, how to build on a piece of land, they're really incredibly stingy um, compared to pretty much any other city in the United States. And so um, the stinginess of the entitlements process, um, broadly speaking, that really limits what you can get through tools like inclusionary zoning, which are often the only tool that are gonna produce affordable housing in an area like Ward 3, where the cost of land is very high. So, I, you know, overall, I think it's just, I think it's just a matter of perspective and, and, and kind of like what you're familiar with. Like, you know, I was born and raised in DC and I remember like the first time I went to Seattle, I went to visit like a friend at their office and the, the building was so tall that I had to take one elevator and then like switch to another elevator to go higher because it was just taller than an elevator could even go. But people from DC haven't ever been in a building that's more than, you know, 12, 14 stories tall. And so, I literally didn't know that there were buildings that were so tall that they needed these kinds of elevators. In, in other places, just the entitle, entitlements are more generous. And so it's easy to, it's, you can get more from programs like IZ. The one exception to that in DC, which isn't that amazing to me in terms of the spectrum of creative zoning that I've seen out there is uh, the planned unit development process or PUD process. And per Patrick's description, I wasn't that surprised to hear that like it had been used effectively to build some affordable housing. But the fact that the PUD process is totally broken at this point by litigation 
is also, you know, putting us in a situation where it means like, that's a tool that, you know, I, I live right, right next to it. I live in a PUD actually, but I also live next to a, a, a site that is presumably going to want to be renegotiating its PUD really soon. And if that process wasn't broken, affordable housing could be part of that conversation and could be, a, that could be a big opportunity to get a lot of units, but it's not working right now. I think my answer very quickly would be similar to Patrick's as relates to a lack of, of large opportunity sites. Uh, and Director Trueblood mentioned this earlier in terms of there's not a whole lot of large scale publicly owned property in Ward 3. Um, so I think one thing that we'll collectively need to do is a much more granular search you know, throughout the community to identify opportunity sites and to understand at a very detailed level for each of those opportunity sites exactly what it will take to actually move that site to the market. So it could be a privately owned parking lot or one story retail building. You know, there's tons of those types of properties you know, along our major transit corridors on Wisconsin and Connecticut that we'll need to, to dive into to understand exactly how all these tools might move those sites to the market for affordable housing. Um, there were a couple more comments and, that came through. And, one with regard to, a, sorry. oh, go ahead. And can I, I just wanna say two quick, very quick things. Number one, uh, we're doing that effort a little bit right now in Chevy Chase. Uh, please join, if you're interested, uh, the Chevy Chase Small Area Plan. Uh, we'll be doing we'll be beginning that real outreach in 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 um in this this month with a survey and then more coming over the coming months so that we will be looking at those sites including the one district owned property uh that's there but as well as more broadly but i also just want to say the other challenge we have is money right if, if we if one dollar can go twice as far in ward eight what you know the traditional path has been okay we're going to get two unit you know we'll get we'll, we'll get a unit for half the price in ward eight I think we're, the, the mayor and um, and DHE and others are, and and the council member Councilor Jay are saying, well, maybe we need to rethink those numbers. But even then, uh, it's going to be challenging if if because of the cost of of, of land. Uh, and so I think that's just something that we're we're all going to be grappling with from a, a financial budget uh, policy perspective. Um, I like to give a thank you to all of our panelists and pitch it back to Commissioner Christeel to, to wrap us up with our, our call to action and where we go from here. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, uh, Director Trueblood, Council Member Che, Tracy, and Patrick for a, a wonderful panel. Hopefully, um, hopefully it wasn't too much information overload tonight. Um, I think the call to action, <laughs> you can see, <laughs> Maybe Director Trueblood or maybe not. <laughs> All right, so I think there's a number of things we can do as, as I think as people have talked about, there's the last call for comments on the comp plan amendment. So I imagine we'll be sending our final um, sort of messages to the council members and the mayor. Um, speaking of money, there's the FY22 budget process, which is um, was going to get kicked off, but I guess it's getting kicked off on May 27th when the mayor releases her budget. So um, speaking of money, this is the time to be thinking about, um, I know Commissioner, uh, excuse me, Director Trueblood, you said I think the trust fund had about $130 million in it last year. That was the highest amount, but I've heard of other groups pushing for maybe 200 million or even more for the trust fund in this year. So I think it's, you know, that is something that if there's, you know, we're looking for gap financing, you know, the trust fund is one, it's, it's an obvious source here, you know, in, in Ward 3. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, the, the other part of the, the budget process is, is it's not just the trust fund, but it's also funds for services that support housing. So that's Department of Human Services and other places. But the point is, it's really time to look at the budget um, and, and kind of advocacy that we can do. I know in our own ANC, 3, ANC 3F, we're looking at resolutions that are supporting housing programs, also transportation programs uh, and more. So um, I can't think of any other uh, call to action, although I think you did, uh, Commissioner Wall, Stan, you mentioned you know, there's not a lot of large sites in Ward 3, but for the ones that have been mentioned, so it really is kind of getting to the kind of next level, you know, like for example, on Connecticut Avenue, you know, where are some in potential infill sites? On Wisconsin Avenue, where are potential infill sites? Maybe on Mass Ave, um, and again, perhaps through the small area planning process, um, these sites will be identified, but it really is time to kind of roll up our sleeves. Um, 
and <laughs> you know get get to work. Um, I appreciate all the time and effort that the panel put in. Um, certainly appreciate one of our sponsors, the Coalition for Smart Growth, and, and Cheryl Court, that's done a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, I also want to thank uh, Ward Three Vision for putting this on, and again appreciate all of you for showing up. I don't know, Cheryl, you want to say any last words? No, I think we need to wrap up. Thanks so much for um, a great panel and um, we'll, we can continue this discussion. Right, and this is the, all the information will be on the websites, uh, including this presentation. So thanks, have a good night, stay safe.